if memory serves. Yep, that's about right. Let's get that door closed, would you? We up? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, I guess if you want to make sense out of the 13th chapter, the first thing that needs to happen is um, the first thing that has to happen is you have to know that at the beginning of the chapter a question was asked. So Arjun asked Krishna a question. And he asked him to define six terms. So there's a whole body of literature, um, Vedic literature, old Indic Sanskrit literature, called the Upanishads. The Upanishads are a number of texts. Um, and they, they share certain um, basic features. And they also have kind of a formula to them. Anyway, they deal with existential metaphysical subjects, but, and they, they extend um, the ritual of the Vedas and, and tease out its esoteric implications. But uh, the, the feature I want to discuss in the Upanishads was that they, they follow a formula, and the formula is there's questions asked by a disciple to a guru, and then the guru gives answers. And then subsequent questions are asked, follow-up questions are asked, and things move forward like that. So Arjun asking Krishna to define six key philosophical terms um, it, it, it's very kind of standard or normal uh, for an Upanishad to have a disciple asking questions of a guru. And Krishna, Arjuna did say at the beginning of the text, Shishaste ham shadi mam tvam prapanam. He said, I'm your disciple. And so the rest of the text from that kind of opening exchange in the second chapter has been proceeding in a very Upanishadic fashion. So much so that in every chapter of the Gita in the, in the, in the, usually closes with a statement that thus ends the Gita Upanishad. So they even, they even call it the Gita Upanishad, which means the Gita Upanishad. Do you guys follow that? So there's a body of Vedic texts, old Vedic texts called the Upanishads. They deal with all things metaphysical, and they go beyond the normal discussion of Dharma that you would find in even earlier Vedic literature, where we were just discussing ritual and proper action, and they begin to tease out some philosophical ideas. And one of the formulas of, of you know how the Upanishads move forward is that there's a disciple asking questions of a guru. And there's a back and forth. Answers are given. Questions are loaded. So it's not that they're just being asked in a vacuum, but the questions themselves display to some extent the worldview of the questioner. And then the guru speaks, and that gives rise to further questions, and thus the entire genre of Upanishads rolls forward. Did you guys follow this? All right. Did you notice I repeated myself twice? because you guys really didn't seem like you were firing all cylinders when I said it the first time. And we're just getting out of the train station, so I want to make sure we're all moving in unison like a well-oiled machine. We good? The word Upanishad is actually made up of three different words, Upa, Ni, and Shud. Shud means to calm down or quiet down or sink down. That's where you get the word Prashad from, Prasad in Sanskrit. Prashad in Bengali. Prasad means tranquil. We use it in a secondary way to mean some remnant of the deity, a flower that was offered or something like that. But if you look at the primary meaning of 
Prashad in Sanskrit it uh, means tranquility from shud to sit down to sink down so Upanishad um, uh, um, knee means down and shud means to sit and upa means close so if you're telling somebody something that's high, that's esoteric, that's advanced, then you'll say, you know, come here, sit down. We, in English, uh, in America, we go like this. In India, they go like this. Which people don't really know what you're doing. It's kind of like this, but it means come. Come close. So if you want to call somebody close because you want to tell them something private, you'll say, come and sit down here next to me. And then you'll speak to them out of earshot of others, and you'll tell them something very confidential or very advanced, just for them. So literally the word Upanishad means that this body of text is dealing with that type of information. So you got Arjuna asking Krishna six things. And so the six things are, what is Kshetra? What is Kshetra Gya? What is Gyanam? And that's what we've covered so far. So Kshetra means what is the field. Like Kuru Kshetra means field of the Kuru. It's the place where the battle took place, where the Gita was spoken. So what is the field? And that was answered by Krishna. The field is Sharira. Sharira literally means that thing which decays, the body. The field is the body. And Chetra Gya, the knower of the field, is the soul. The conscious soul that inhabits a body. And then Krishna also knows the body, but he's Sarva Chetrani. He knows all. He knows all bodies. He's omniscient. And so if you think about it, your consciousness is limited by your body. Like we might say, I know how you're feeling to somebody else. But we don't exactly know how someone's feeling because feeling is done in the first person. Consciousness is always in the first person. That's why there's a part of the philosophy called phenomenology, dealing with first person subjective matter because Science can teach objective things. It can teach you how big a, you know, a table is or how many pages are in a book. But there's a whole massive piece of reality. In fact, it is reality that is experienced in the first person subjectively. We like to think that subjective truths are less real than objective truths. But that's preposterous because the only way you can find any objective truths is to subjectively exist and be conscious of the world. There is no such thing as objective consciousness. Because consciousness is always, by definition, experienced in the first person by an individual. Did you guys follow that? Think about it. You might say we are collectively conscious. But what that really means is all of us are individually conscious as a primary principle. And then as a derivative principle, we all get together and become maybe even synergistically, collectively conscious in some sort of greater way. But that's always dependent on individual consciousness as a starting place. Do you guys follow that? It's interesting, isn't it? We say that objective truth is more real than subjective truth. But the only objective truths you can possibly know are all dependent on you being subjectively aware and conscious of reality. Therefore, objective truth is derivative. <laughs> derivative of subjective truth. And there's a whole department of philosophy that contends with this. There's a whole department of science that contends with it. Philosophy of mind. Consciousness studies phenomenology, you just can't get around it. Does that make sense? It's interesting, right? 
we should not discount consciousness because it's subjectively available to us. And when we think about it, I might say I know how you feel, but I don't actually know how you feel because I would have to be you in order to know how you feel. I empathize with you by using my own life experience and extrapolating from that and putting myself in your shoes and trying to imagine what you might feel like. Or maybe I look for symptoms uh, in your mannerisms. And I remember when I had those same symptoms and how I felt at that exact moment and I say, I know how you feel. But it's always an approximation. because we are limited. We're fully conscious. I mean, we're not actually even fully conscious of our whole body. There's your whole sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and, 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 and they go on automatically, autonomically without you thinking about it. Like how often do you think about breathing? But yet, here we are breathing over and over and over again without even thinking about it. We're not, how often are you conscious of your heartbeat? but yet it continues to be. So many processes go on in your body that are happening when you're right there, front and center, you're the organism, but you're not fully conscious of them. But we are most conscious of our own bodies. And then we extrapolate and extend that. We look for symptoms in other people. This leads to all sorts of things and philosophy like philosophical zombies where theoretically there's no reason why somebody couldn't behave like they were conscious but not actually be conscious. There's no reason why somebody has to be conscious in order to exist in this world and so people could theoretically be philosophical zombies with no conscious awareness. You might be the only truly conscious person in the world and there's no objective proof that other people are conscious. There's analogous proof. They seem to behave like you do. They seem to have similar features that you do. And therefore, we, because we know we're conscious, we assume others are conscious as well. But you can never really fully know. And here's, that might sound really far out, but I mean, that idea is hundreds of years old in philosophy, and it's still fully accepted. If you think it might bother you, but if you think about it hard enough, you realize, geez, that makes sense. And if you pursue a master's degree in philosophy, you will find out that this is still very much the case in philosophy. And if you sat with me and debated it with me, that no, we know other people are conscious objectively, I would be able to demonstrate as we went back and forth that actually all you have is symptoms that suggest consciousness. But you can't know they're conscious because consciousness is, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, always experience in the first person. Therefore, there's no objective way to prove consciousness. You guys following this? Like, I'm not just saying it fast three times and like it sounds good. It actually works, right? Okay, and he's getting his master's in philosophy, so at least, you know, he's fooled by what I'm saying. Um... Philosophical zombies might be a bit esoteric and difficult to wrap your head around on the first pass, but here's what's not. Imagine somebody without any conscience, without any empathy. Do you have empathy? Everyone in the room except for Madhuri nods their head. She, I thought you had to, you had to run your program. <laughs> and so, however, it does seem to be that there are people in the world without empathy. They have perhaps what's considered to be the worst mental illness. I mean, some people think it's incredibly freeing, but usually those people are, um, they just really embrace their dark side. But we have a, a name for people who are devoid of empathy. Do you guys know what it is? I don't know, are you hissing at me? What is it? Sociopaths, that's right, sociopaths. And the more proper term is antisocial personality disorder, APD. That's the more common, that's, that's the term which is used nowadays, 
right? ASPD, there you go. They throw in the social. So it's antisocial personality disorder. That's what's using the DSM, which is where all the mental illnesses are listed. And they come up with new names for them every so many years. So when you think sociopath, the modern term is antisocial personality disorder. And it does seem that there are people in the world who are devoid of empathy. They can commit a terrible, atrocious crime and feel no remorse. They also, by the way, don't feel loved. There's a whole bunch of like wonderful emotions that they don't feel that are really dependent on empathy and feeling for someone else, feeling with somebody else. Um, if you accept that sociopaths exist, then you're accepting that there's people who look just like you and me, may cry on cue, may seem just like us, but there's actually a whole block, like there's a whole like gap in their existence that is totally disturbing to think about. Do you guys follow this? Most of us would have at least some passing familiarity with somebody with narcissistic personality disorder. Or at least with narcissistic tendencies, which is a diminished uh, capacity for empathy. And so at least most of us have had experience of that. We've probably met a few sociopaths in our time too. I think they're one out of a hundred. I think they're one percent of the population, something like that. So we would have met them. We just, usually they're pretty good at hiding it. Usually they're pretty good at hiding it. At one point in my life, I went on sociopath chat rooms <laughs> because because I found out they existed, and I was like, "Oh my God, I got to check these guys out." Now I was dealing with people who had antisocial personality disorder and people who were related to them, and I had to try to wrap my head around the subject matter. So I read some books and I went on chat rooms to get a feel for what was going on. I was just, it was far out because these were all, none of these people were, you know, killers or anything like that. But I, I remember they were, they, were, they were talking about how they learned to fake emotion. And, 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 uh, and, they were lamenting how there's always a pause. Like as they go through their mind and think of what the reaction should be and then, and then willfully manifest the reaction, there's a pause. And their loved ones can figure it out because they've lived with them for so long. They know that they're fake crying and they're fake doing stuff. There's a little pause. And then, like, then they do it all perfect. And they were like lamenting and commiserating with one another. Yeah, I get caught all the time by my spouse too. Yeah, I get caught by my friend all the time. Most people don't catch it because I really try to lessen that gap. But they could, they, 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 they could still suss it out and figure it out. There's a famous book, a popular book called The Sociopath Next Door because most sociopaths are not um, violent. They're, you know, law-abiding citizens. You, you can never make an argument based on empathy. How would you feel if that happened to you? And, you, know, I, you know, don't you feel badly that you've hurt this person? You always have to make it about them. Like, you know, if you hurt that person, then you will lose your privileges. Then you might go to jail and that will be more painful for you. you. You like being outside and being able to do what you want to do. It's like a whole different way of counseling them, which is all based on making it about them. So, the reason why I went on, went on a long, long tangent was if you have a hard time wrapping your head around philosophical zombies, you, it shouldn't be as big of a, a reach for you to think about people devoid of empathy. That's usually something that you're more familiar with. It's also a radical concept, but at least most people have thought about that or read an article about that or fathomed that had some experience with that. Watch somebody without any, any sense of remorse. And that's, 
it's not that it's 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 not even that it's more like difficult to wrap your head around it's just we probably have a little more familiarity with fathoming it and so it's a little less foreign it's a little more easy for us to to step into that and think about it you guys with me so chaitra chaitra gya the knower of the body your body and then the person who knows all bodies and that's krishna as the omnipotent and if you're omnipotent what are you automatically well that's what omnipotent means so that's like saying if you're black what are you and you're like you're black it's like no duh i just said that but i'm asking for another thing you can get from that if you're omnipotent what are you and why are you omniscient if you're omnipotent I'm asking why. If you have the power to do everything, do you know everything? You don't just get to restate my question as an answer. I'm like, if you're omnipotent, what does that mean? It means you're omnipotent. No duh. Okay? No, it means you're omniscient. Okay, why do you mean that? Because if you're omnipotent, you're omniscient. Like you said it real clever, like it was, a, it was an answer, but you actually just restated my question with confidence. Why does omnipotence entail omniscience? By the way, you heard me say that last week but you didn't understand the reason I gave for it. So you can give the right answer, but you can't give the logic behind the answer, which works as long as the people you're talking to never ask you why. And so you're cool with most adults. You're not cool with smart adults, and that's, that's the minority, but you're, you're also not cool with kids because most kids will just go, why? And then you're like, ah, and you're like, you're like, you're just so annoying. And, but it's actually, they're just forcing you to be logical is what it really is. Kids are fantastic. They're all mini Socrateses walking around asking you why. Sometimes they get just playful with it. So I'll go, why are you asking why to my daughter? And she's like, ah, I didn't show the... And I'll start asking her why. And she'll go, why are you asking why? At a certain point, it becomes unreasonable and just, and just uh, um, indulgent. But my question was not that. It was reasonable. Why does omniscience... Why is omniscience entailed by omnipotence? Yeah? Because knowledge is a part of power? Because knowledge is a power. And so omnipotence would be all powerful, and one of your powers would be knowledge, and therefore you would automatically be all knowing. Just like you'd also be all strong if you're all powerful. You'd also be, I don't know, uh, eternal if you're all powerful. Because one of your powers would be the power to contradict ent entropy. And so there's all sorts of things you can get from omnipotence. One thing you can't get from omnipotence is all good. That's right. Omnibenevolence has to be argued for separately. Anyway, Krishna makes a statement. The body, the chetra, the body, the field is the body, and chetragya, the knower, of that body is the soul and then Krishna is different from us in that he knows everything because he's all powerful. You guys following this? And then there's some more, then, then also jnana is discussed, knowledge. And so the, the first answer Krishna gives for what is knowledge? Knowledge is to know the difference between the body and the soul. And that's pretty profound. It's simple, it's elegant, it's also profound. To know the difference between the body and the soul is knowledge. And then Krishna goes further and explains how one might acquire knowledge by being humble and tolerant and peaceful, self-controlled, interested in spiritual topics. And he gives a whole list of 20 items that result in acquiring knowledge, a knowledge lifestyle. Because one thing to say, this is knowledge, but a better answer would be, this is knowledge and here's how to get it. And so Krishna not only gives you the answer of what is knowledge, but he also explains what are the things you can do in the here and now that will result in you getting knowledge. Like a lot of times people talk about faith. As this thing you just either have or you don't. I've got to have faith in Jesus. Well, I don't. Like, how do I get it? Got to read the Bible. I read it. Seems really, really twisted up. Not impressed at all. There's a few good ideas in there, but there's a lot of weird stuff in there too. Not into. 
you got to have faith. I know. I want to have faith. You told me that already. How do I get it? You got to believe, okay? That you just switched out the word faith for belief. How do I believe? Well, you just got to do it. I know, but I didn't just do it. So you got to tell me how to do it so I can do it. Is there a switch behind my ear that I just never found out about? A little button? I press that and all of a sudden I have faith? Like, how do I get it? Did you guys follow that little back and forth? A lot of times people introduce these ideas, faith, belief, knowledge, whatever, but they don't tell you how to actually get it. You have to realize you're not the body. I know, but I don't. I think I'm my body. I think I'm growing old. I think I'm going to die someday. I'm freaked out about it. I'm scared. If you really want to help somebody, you got to give them truth and then help them to understand that truth, help them to own that truth, help them to see that truth. Aristotle, he said, there's, there's two types of speech. Say something and then prove it. There's two parts to any speech, any human speech. You're either saying something or you're giving evidence for it. You're proving it. You know what the word rhetoric means? Rhetoric is the study of persuasive speech, persuasive arguments. You know who are the modern day rhetoricians? There's only one group of people on the planet that are the modern day rhetoricians. You know who they are? Nope. I actually, that's true. Okay, two groups. Lawyers. Not the one I'm thinking of. Huh? Lawyers. Lawyers are modern day rhetoricians. Politicians are more demagogues. But I mean, that's a form of rhetoric. That's a form of rhetoric. Kind of pandering to people's basest, you know, tendencies. That is a form of rhetoric. It's a kind of a popular argument. Appeal to the people. Appeal to emotion. Um, but if you really want to look at modern day rhetoricians, it's lawyers. When it's the most important thing in the world, you're going to trial, you hire people whose, are, whose job it is is to persuade other people, either 12 people or one person, depending on what kind of court situation you're in. And you're, they're supposed to persuade them on your behalf by constructing really good, logical, reasonable, persuasive arguments. Rhetoric is like the most important thing in the world. It's how you get along in the world opens doors for you, helps you to connect with people, helps you negotiate with people, keep things fair. I mean, it's just, it's everything. We're all rhetoricians. We all employ logic and appeals to emotion and all sorts of, you know, you sometimes you employ bad logic, but most people, when they take a, a, a you know, beginner logic class, they're like, oh, I do that. Oh, I know that. Oh, yeah. Because really, you're, you're discovering and fleshing out and making a study of and categorizing stuff you've been doing your whole life. And by slowing it down and realizing what you've been doing your whole life, you're able to do it better and recognize mistakes you make. But you've actually been doing it ever since you learned how to speak. My daughter makes rhetorical arguments to me all the time. She's three. She makes rhetorical arguments at the age of three. She'll say to, she'll say to her siblings, you better give me that or I'm going to tell dad. That's actually a rhetorical argument. That, that's an argument. That's a rhetorical argument. There's a threat <laughs> that there's a consequence to their actions and she's trying to get them to comply with her desires and she's using leverage to compel them to comply. You follow? It's quite sophisticated. She's three. We learn that as we learn how to speak. So Krishna makes an argument not only for what is knowledge. Knowledge is the knowledge of what? Huh? I can't hear you. Wisdom is another word for knowledge. doesn't answer my question. Knowledge is to know the difference between the soul and the body. And then Krishna takes it a step further and he explains how to acquire that knowledge. 
the lifestyle choices you can make that will allow that knowledge to occur. Just like if you explain to somebody the lifestyle choices they can make that would allow them to have faith instead of just saying have faith, like some kind of order. And of course, if you just tell people I have faith, I don't care, I have faith, that means they're just totally blind. They're a total fanatic. There's no reason behind what they're doing. And that's like the beginning of really bad stuff happening. That's a problem. If I just have faith, like, okay. Then what if you say, just go kill that person? Like, okay. Like, that's bad. We don't want people like that walking around. So we should never encourage that kind of behavior. And when we hand people knowledge, we should also give with that the way they can understand that knowledge and acquire that knowledge themselves. So three topics got covered. Jnanam, knowledge, and how to acquire that knowledge. Chaitra, the field, which is the body in this context, because of philosophical dialogue. Maybe he was going to say, let's say we were like, like buying a property together. Let's say we were shopping for a farm. And Mason says to me, hey, what's the field? Where's the field? What's the field? And I was like, oh, the field is this 23-acre farm in Escondido. What does that sound? Okay. Sound like somebody was cutting their nails. And I was like, oh my God, it's totally disturbing my mind. <laughs> this is, it sounded like clippers to me. Anyway, so um, I heard my son this morning in the bathroom clipping his nails. And I was like, ah, I hate it when you do that. <laughs> my life cleaning up the nails of my children. Um, I mean, anyway, I used to have to clip all of my children's nails. So at least now they clip their own nails. And they just have to clean up, you know, what they don't get down the sink. Um, but anyway, so if somebody was to say in a different context, what's the field? Or who's the knower of the field? It might be the person who knows that land really well. It might be a piece of land somewhere that we're buying. But in the philosophical context, the field is the body and the knower is the soul. And the knower of all bodies is Krishna, who is omniscient and therefore different than us. And then there's knowledge that you know the difference between the two things, the body and the soul. I mean, that's a pretty important thing. If you know that you're the soul and not the body, if you know you're a soul and you have a body, you don't have a soul. My soul is an improper statement, grammatically. My soul. If you say my soul, that's an improper statement. Because that would indicate that you are not your soul, you're something else, and you possess a soul. You follow? It's, it's, it's a misstatement. It's quite common. You say, my body. My body's hurting. We don't say that, we say, I'm hurting. Right? So, um, to know that would really change the world you lived in. To really know that you're not the body would, would change dramatically the lifestyle you live, what you give importance to, what you spend your time pursuing. So much of what we do is based on a tacit acceptance that we're the body, an unstated premise that we're the body, and therefore the most important thing is to do stuff for our body. So jnana, knowledge, and then how to acquire knowledge. And that leads us to the next three subjects of this chapter. Krishna also answers three more questions. The first one is, what is gyayam? What does the word gyayam mean in Sanskrit? Gyayam. Yes. That which is knowable? The to be known. The knowable. Now, I think it's important to understand what the word gyayam actually means. That's what it literally means. But what it actually means is this. What is the most worthy thing to devote yourself to? What is worthy of valuing above all other things? 
What is the highest object you can contemplate? What is the highest thing you can take your God-given ability to know and then use to know? Can you guys follow this? So what is the knowable? Interestingly, in the Bible, if you read a translation of the Bible, it'll say, he knew her. Do you guys know what that means in context? means they had sex. It's a euphemism. Just like we use the word bathroom. But you don't necessarily just take your bath in the bathroom. You defecate in the bathroom. We, but we call it a bathroom or a washroom or a water closet. Actually, interestingly enough, that the word toilet used to be a euphemism for a schoolroom. It was a more nice way of saying, you know, a place where you would defecate. I don't know what the previous word was. But then the word toilet itself automatically became the bad word. Then they came up with another word, bathroom. But then the word bathroom has also become a bad word. Then they came up with washroom. And it's, there's certain words like this where it, it's, it's, it refers to something which is considered to be negative in society. And therefore, whatever term you come up with to refer that thing, inevitably that term will eventually become derogatory and need to be replaced by a euphemism. Do you guys follow that? For instance, we, there are terms like retard and moron and imbecile. Those are medical terms that were developed to give specific levels of intelligence. So like, I think an, uh, I think, you know, I, I think an imbecile might be below 20 IQ and maybe a moron is below 70. There's, there's these different terms that are used. A mongoloid is in there as well somewhere. But then all these terms, which were originally supposed to be nice terms used. Oh, idiot is there. The word idiot was also there. I think idiot might be 20 to 40. Zero to 20. Zero to 20 is an idiot? Are you sure? All right. Zero to 24 is an idiot. Then? Is? Imbecile. Imbecile. 50 to 70 is a moron. 51 to 70 is a moron, right? And then 71 or above is... So those were originally terms that were used scientifically. But the nature is, because they were referring to something derogatory, eventually those terms themselves became the very thing they were attempting to avoid, which was denigrating. You got to come up with new language. So there's just there's some things like that, where you know whatever term is used for it, automatically becomes a bad thing. And you just have to keep on coming up you know, every generation with a new euphemism because the, the previous word makes people uncomfortable. So, knowing somebody is a euphemism. And in a certain context, like in the Bible, if you read a translation of the Bible, when it says, and they knew each other, it meant that they... Yeah, and they knew each other and a child was born. That's like, you'll see those kind of statements. That's what they'll say. They, they knew each other and a child was born. You're, like, you're left like wondering, she's like, what? Like, I got to be careful who I get to know because like kids start like appearing out of nowhere. But in that context, it means something. So here it's to be known, but it has, it, 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 it has a philosophical implication, which is clear from reading the text itself which we're going to do now. But what is to be known is what is to be valued, what is to be pursued, what is the highest object of knowledge, what is the most worthy thing of pursuing with one's life. And the, the study, the philosophical study of what is beautiful, what is good, what is true, what is beautiful, what is worth pursuing, what has value, that is known as, what's that philosophical study called? Aesthetics. Aesthetic is what is beautiful. And ethics is what is good. But there's a combined study of both of those together. And it's called? I forgot. Oh, God. Sorry. Axiology. Axiology is the combined study of both ethics and aesthetics. What is good and what is beautiful. Ergo, what has value. What is worthy of pursuing. You guys following this? And so when Krishna says, 
I'll tell you what is Gyeam. And Arjuna says, what is Gyeam? It means what is worthy of knowing in this world. What is worthy of pursuing? What is worthy of knowing? You follow this? Let's leave that door open, huh? Let's crack this other one too. Let me just grab that one. Try and get a little air in here, huh? Is this making sense to everybody? All right. That was a 40-minute intro. I felt like you guys needed it. Not because you're imbecilic <laughs> or moronic, but just because. <laughs> so now we got the next statement. I shall now explain to you the knowable, knowing which you will taste the eternal. Brahman, the spirit, beginningless and subordinate to me, lies beyond the cause and effect of this material world. Let's read that again. You see how pregnant that statement is? This isn't easy reading. You guys might think, oh, he just bored us with this 40-minute thing. But now I'm going to read the sentence that that 40 minutes was designed to help you appreciate, and you'll see it's no joke. I shall now explain to you the knowable. So what's the word for the knowable? Gyeam yatta pravakshami. I will speak that which is gyeam. So he's answering the question, what is gyeam? Yat, gyatva amritam ashnute. After, after knowing it, yatva means after knowing this, having known this. Having known this. Having known that which is noble. Same root, you follow? Gyam is from gya, where you get the word gnosis from in English. Like I'm an agnostic, I don't know whether God exists. So gyam, yatta pravakshami, I will now explain that which is knowable. Yat yatva amritam ashnute, and having having known that same word yatva means it's the verb. Having known that what that which is knowable, you will experience amrit. Amrit means immortality. Anadi matpadam brahma. Anadi mat. It is beginningless. Param Brahma, that supreme Brahman. So what is the what is knowable? What is the most valuable thing you can know in this world? Brahman. You follow? Krishna says it. I'm going to explain this to you. Having known this, you'll taste immortality. This Brahman is anadi mutt. Supreme Brahman is anadi mutt. It's beginningless. It's eternal. Therefore, by knowing it, you yourself will become eternal. It is, it is said to not exist and also not not exist. <laughs> what does that mean? It is said to not exist and also not not exist. That's classic Upanishadic Sanskrit. What's called in English excuse me, apophatic theology. Via negativa theology. Where you say, I'm here. You guys, the devotees can look over there. I guess you guys are all devotees, but let's try to pay attention to class. Um, The Upanishads are famous for speaking in apophatic language where you say what something is not. So Brahman is, does not exist. Doesn't exist like things in this world exist or don't exist. It doesn't come and go like things in this world come and go. You exist, but you could just easily have not existed. Your parents could have chosen not to know each other and then you wouldn't exist. 
one person got it. You follow? And in due course of time, you may cease to exist. The thing we're talking about is not like that. It's not something which could exist or could not exist. It's not something which may come into being or may go out of being. It's a nadimat. It's always existed. It's beginningless. It's Param Brahma. It's the great Brahman. And it is nasat. It's beyond the... Sat asat means cause and effect. But in Sanskrit it's said effect cause. Because if you want to study the cause of something, where do you start? Yeah, like if you want to find out that all men are mortal, that's, that's like a cause, right? All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, ergo he's mortal, right? The ocean is salty, this is from the ocean, therefore it must also be salty, right? All men die, you are a man or a woman, therefore you will die, right? How do I find out that all men are mortal? Not by seeing somebody die. That would just prove to me that one person is mortal. Yeah? Everyone you know has died. Or you've seen so many people die. That's right. Made it through that. All deductive logic is based on induction for its existence. You see examples and then you work backwards from those examples. Is it bugging you guys? No? You cool? Okay. You you see examples and then you work backwards from those examples to the causes of those examples. We say cause and effect because really the cause creates the effect, but from a point of view of philosophical inquiry, you should say effect cause because you see the effects and then you work philosophically backwards to the cause. Do you guys follow that? The bedrock of all deductive arguments is induction. Individual examples and then allow you to look at things in broader terms. So, sat asat means effect cause in Sanskrit. So, Prabhupada translates as it is beyond the cause and effect of this world. It's a good translation. Super clean. It's beyond the cause and effect of this material world. However, you could also say it does not exist and it does not not exist. It's just, that's a really tough statement to explain. So th this one's easier. But it doesn't exist in the same way that you exist. Because it's eternal. It's always existed. And by knowing that eternal thing, you also become eternal. Now, are you already eternal? Yes, you are, but you don't know it. So by knowing this thing, you will become aware of your eternality. You'll be able to experience your eternality. You'll be able to live with, with that eternality. And it does not not exist, meaning it does exist. It doesn't exist or not exist like things in this world exist or not exist. It's beyond this world, exists beyond this world. That's what it's trying to do. So via negativa philosophy tries to explain to you that don't try to think it's like you. Remember how I said we're individually conscious? Remember I said that all of our understanding of the world comes from our own first-person experience? So that means it's dangerous because if you go too far with that first-person experience, you can't break out of the limitations of your own powers of thought. So you can approach the divine through logic and reason, but the divine is really translogical and trans-reasonable. You get to a certain point, and at a certain point, you have to jump off and go beyond your mind. Not in a blind faith way, but in I've done everything I can possibly do and I've understood everything I can possibly understand and I know there's something beyond and now I'm going to step into that. Do you guys follow that? Remember that whole thing we did on first person? It seemed like it was a tangent? It wasn't. It was so I could make this point and not spend half an hour on it. When you're dealing with transcendent subject matter and you're in a body with a mind, then that body and mind will initially facilitate your journey, help you not make a terrible mistake and leap off a cliff foolishly. 
but eventually they will have to be transcended so that you can actually taste the absolute. It takes us just to the edge. It gives us a check and balance system. But logic is not exactly synonymous with an experience of transcendence. Knowing the person logos is not exactly the same as using logic in this world. The entity logos, the original personal manifestation of logic, God, is different than the abstract principles that are derivative of him, which is logic in this world. And so if you can expertly understand this, you can make the best use of your body and mind to take you right to the edge of transcendence, and then you'll be able to amritam ashnute. Yatva mam amritam ashnute. You'll be able to, knowing this, experience immortality. By engaging with something which is fundamentally transcendental, beyond the cause and effect of this world, not existing or not existing like things in this world exist or don't exist. Do you see how unbelievably deep and pregnant and philosophical the single verse we are now studying is? And how the whole 40 minutes we spent previously unpacking all sorts of tangential stuff becomes useful to understand this? Do you guys follow it? Now, remember when I said axiology and what's worthy of knowing and what Krishna is really saying isn't just what's knowable, but he's saying what's worthy of your attention? This is this single verse. The introduction of Gyeam itself tells you what's what, about Gyeam. It is the most worthy thing of studying. It is something which is categorically different and better than all other topics of study and is worthy of your worship and is transcendental. Now, you think, okay, I'm smart. I'm spiritual. I know a couple of mudras. And so I, I, can, I can grasp this. And Krishna is just so sophisticated. This is the next verse he comes up with. Everywhere are his hands and legs, his eyes, heads, and faces, and he has ears everywhere. In this way, the super soul exists pervading everything. Let me read that again. Everywhere are his hands and legs, his eyes, heads, and faces. And he has ears everywhere. In this way, the super soul exists pervading everything. Do you understand why that's totally vexing? Why? Because the last thing we just read talks about Brahman and this one talks about the super soul. No. Oh, okay. No. It's the same thing. No, it just says it says that, meaning that which was referred to in the last verse. Yeah. Yes. This verse talks about how Brahman is in this world. <laughs> like the Upanishads say, he has no ears, but he hears everything. He has no legs, but he moves everywhere at the speed of the mind. He has no eyes, but he sees everything. Understand Brahman. It's like the, it throws weird stuff at you like that, which is designed to vex you. So this one is, Brahman is beyond the cause and effect of this world. Brahman is eternal. Brahman, right? Is, and it says, Brahman has eyes, ears, heads legs, feet, everywhere. But that means Brahman is imminent. Brahman is this world. But we just got, being, we just got done being told that Brahman is transcendent. Brahman is that worldly. But now the next verse is that Brahman is this worldly. How do you reconcile that? you're going to fail. 
I'm just, I'm a betting man. I'm actually not, but if I was a betting man, I'm going to bet on you failing. All right, let's go. What do you got? Uh, now that you said that, our confidence is <laughs> Diminished. I don't blame you. I mean, even if you get the right answer, I could, I could like, do a little, like, verbal jujitsu and because I got the mic and stuff, you know, and I'm in the big chair. Like, right? You think you know? I have an answer. All right. See how clever that was? I have an answer? Yeah. What a great rhetorical position, right? I have an answer, because people are hard for you to say that's not an answer. Unless you say something really dumb now. At least it's an answer. It might not be the answer, but it's at least an answer. So, just like how we're not the same as our bodies, Roman has these sensory implements in the world, but it's not the same as those things. Okay, so what are Brahman's senses in this world? These arms and legs. So what does that mean? It must have the spiritual senses that are beyond the world and they're manifest in the world through these arms and legs. So what are these arms and legs? I don't know. So, but I mean, what value is there in your explan explanation if you can't explain the verse? Like the verse says, everywhere is arms and legs. So what does that mean? Yeah. I think Krishna is just trying to explain how Brahman um, pervades everything in this world in a way that we can understand because it, we have to. So Brahman doesn't actually have hands or legs or arms or feet or right. heads, right? right? Okay. I don't know. I'm a little worried about calling on somebody else. Give me a sec. Let me think if I if I got the nerve for it. Um, it's like a two strikes. We're 0 and 2. Um, just because I got three minutes, 10 seconds left. Um, it's actually not reconcilable. Krishna just stated he's both transcendent and imminent. There is no reason why an omnipotent being could not be both transcendent and imminent beyond this world and in this world as well. There's no reason why that couldn't be the case. There's no logical reason why Krishna couldn't be everywhere in this world and also beyond this world, in everyone's hearts and also beyond this world, impersonal and also personal. There's no logical reason why an omnipotent being wouldn't have those features and be beyond even things like the law of contradiction to some extent. The thing cannot be itself and its opposite in the same way at the same time. When you talk about omnipotence, you got to really start to use your logical powers of cognition carefully so you don't impinge upon the absolute by anthropomorphically assuming the absolute would be like you and therefore limited in the same way you're limited to your own individual consciousness and in so many other ways. However, although we may logically be able to arrive at the truth that the absolute is simultaneously one and different from everything, and is transcendent and imminent in this world and beyond this world. And that there's nothing wrong with that proposition. And in fact, if there was an absolute, if there was a God, those would be features of that deity. Although you may be able to understand that, the very nature of our limited mind is that we would not be able to simultaneously cognize Krishna being everywhere and nowhere in all things and beyond all things personal and impersonal at the same time. Because the very nature of our mind is that we have to think in a specific way and then the law of contradiction comes into effect and if this is true, then that can't be true. The exact opposite cannot be true in the same way at the same time. Did you follow this? Now we could say we're qualitatively one with God and quantitatively different. We could say that God exists in this world as the genesis of this world and as the spiritual substrate of everything which exists. There are ways that we could explain Krishna's acting as the maintainer, which is the literal meaning of the word Vishnu, the enterer, the thing that enters into and, and substantiates and is the ground of being within this world while at the same time being beyond this world. Give an example like space and wind exists within space. So air is existing in space, but space is simultaneously transcendent to air, and when air is removed from space, space still continues to exist. And space exists as an accommodating principle. That's all pervasive, but at the same time, it's beyond the world because 
foul odors or foul smells or foul things can be put into space and then removed from space and space will remain just as it was, untouched by the thing which occupied it. There are all sorts of ways we could start to really try to help you guys grasp this, but there's also value in acknowledging that the deity is ultimately translogical. And although we can enrich ourselves and move towards transcendence through logic and reason, as I've tried to do in this very conversation, it's also reasonable at a certain point to be like, yeah, how Krishna is simultaneously in everything and beyond everything goes beyond my ability to think. Because there are limits to your ability to think. Your ability to think is not omnipotent. It's not omniscient. So if you are thinking about an omnipotent being, you're going to run into roadblocks at a certain point because you are not omnipotent like the being you're studying. This is where things like grace come into play, where by the grace of an all-powerful and all-good deity, you can have a vision of something which goes beyond your innate abilities, even as a soul. And so in the same way, and here we go, for all the marbles, in the same way that we are conscious of our own body and we're individually conscious and we have to extrapolate from that and we try to empathize with others but we admit we can't exactly know what somebody else's consciousness is like because the very nature of our consciousness is that it's limited similarly we can think about logically and reasonably and we can conclude logically and reasonably that other people are conscious without being able to fully experience their consciousness. Similarly, we can think about the nature of the Absolute and appreciate that the Absolute is simultaneously transcendent and imminent, personal and impersonal, everywhere and nowhere, beyond the cause and effect of this world, and at the same time within this world. Without necessarily being able to fully experience that. Because of the limitations imposed upon us by the mind and the consciousness that we have, which is distinct from Krishna's consciousness. You follow? So there are a number of answers you could give. I gave a few of them real fast. But this is the one I'm favoring today because it's in line with the way that Krishna has distinguished himself from us. And I think there's a value in that also. And grace comes into play there. And it's not, it's not a blind faith. Acknowledging the limits of your own powers of thought is not the same as just blindly leaping into something unexamined. For instance, when you marry somebody, you know, somebody might get married, like Narayan got married this year. Narayan, are you 100% sure that you and your pregnant wife are going to work out? No. How could you be? You've only known her for a couple of years or a year or whatever it is. How could you possibly be 100% convinced? But you're 99.5 or 99.9. There's a number there, and that number was enough for you to bet your life on it. When you drive home from the temple today, can you say with 100% certainty you're not going to get a car and die, uh, get a car accident and die? You can't, but you can say with a reasonable degree of certitude based on statistics and your own driving ability and being you know, uninebriated that there's a high likelihood and that likelihood is enough that you're going to take that chance. We can logically get close enough to the deity to be like, wow, this is worthy of exploring. And now we're not dealing with blind faith anymore. And I spent the entire day trying to logically flesh stuff out with you guys to earn your trust so I could make this radical statement at the end that we shouldn't think that we can encapsulate the deity and own the deity the way we might look at a walnut or something like that. And so preserving some acknowledgement of the infinitude of that which we study, of that which we've determined is most worthy of study, is perfectly reasonable. And we can move forward. In the same way we can't experience somebody else's consciousness the way we experience our own, but yet enough so that we can know their consciousness. The same way we can't know 100% that we're going to make it home, but yet we can drive home with confidence. The same way we can't know about marriage, but we can actually still go, go, go ahead and get married. Similarly, we may not be able to fully understand exactly how Krishna is simultaneously present and not present everywhere, transcendent and imminent, at the same time, in the same way, defying in some ways the law of contradiction. 
but we can still appreciate that now omnipotent deity would be able to do so and move forward with that and have that be enough to enrapture us and engage us in studying the Gayam, the most worthy object to study. Boom. Thank you very much on IGTV. If you're on Facebook, you can hang out for a second. If you're on Zoom. Any feedback? <laughs>